I would like to call the Glossy Board of Mayor and Alderman Special Call Meeting to order Tuesday, March the 17th, 2020, 6 p.m. Roll call, Sharon, please. Alderman no. Keith. Alderman Walls. Here. Vice Mayor Harrington. Here. Alderman Ward. Here. Alderman Bowling. Here. Okay. And the next thing on the agenda is a prayer by Alderman Jeff Poles. Awesome. Will you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for this day. And it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be in your grace and glory and mercy always. And I know these are turbulent times, but I know you're with us. I'm not one bit afraid because I know you're with me. Lord God, please bless us and give us the wisdom and strength today to make the right decisions for our town and our town family. Also, Lord, if you would, please forgive us where we failed you today and forgive us where we've sinned. All this I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next thing on the agenda is remarks from Dr. Stephen May, Director of Sullivan County Health Department. Thank you for having me here. And uh, I was tasked with just bringing you an update on our COVID-19 status here, both in Sullivan County and what are the actions that's taking place. So our current status is we have one case uh, associated with international travel. Uh, he completes his quarantine or isolation uh, tomorrow, the next day, doing well. And uh, we've not had any secondary cases associated with it. We do not have any evidence of secondary community spread uh, with it. And I'll share with you some later good websites to keep up with the latest information, particularly when you're looking, well, how many is in Sullivan County versus the other counties. So what is COVID-19? COVID-19 is a, a coronavirus that uh, originated out of Wuhan, Japan. Uh, it was associated with the uh, live markets and started out probably in bats, then moved into the pangolin, which is the scaly anteater. Uh, at that point, uh, with the live markets where that's a delicacy, um, got started in, in their community, and they've had well over um, hundreds of thousands of cases. Uh, there are a number of types of coronaviruses. We have coronaviruses that make us sick with coughs and colds every flu season. That's part of what's with the flu bugs. And there's two special viruses that we've had are coronaviruses that you all are familiar with. Uh, one's called MERS-CoV. It was the bad one that started out of the Mediterranean and associated with camels. Um, we were able to isolate it and contain it without having massive worldwide spread. The other coronavirus you may have heard about is SARS, uh, which we went through a number of years ago, had uh, a number of countries infected. But once again, with isolation, containment, quarantine, we were able to stop the spread. Not so with this virus. Uh, it is now spread worldwide and worldwide, um, lots of deaths associated with it. So what are the symptoms? Usually fever, greater than 100.4. 100, 100 uh, cough, out of uh, just a deep cough. Not the dry upper cough, but it's a deep cough. And the third thing is shortness of breath out of proportion to what you would normally get with a cold. This, this virus has a receptor that binds down deep in the lung, so it tends to cause more pneumonia than it does the cough, cold congestion that you all are used to having with your colds. We know that 80% of patients will not need any type of medical care, won't even seek medical care, or may even be asymptomatic. We know that 15% of patients will seek medical care or may need an evaluation, and 5% of patients are going to get real sick. I'm talking ventilator sick. 
We know that the greatest risk lies with those of us that are over the age of 60. So at 60, the death rate is about 35 to 4%. You can add about 4% death rate for every decade after age 60. We know that if it gets into nursing homes, the death rate in Washington State was 35%. Uh, particularly for those with comorbid conditions. And comorbid conditions, I mean, is like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, on immunosuppressants or biologics, uh, receiving cancer chemotherapy. Uh, that, that type of Im- immunosuppression sets even younger people up for complications. So with that being said, how do we treat it? The short answer is supportive care. We do not have any vaccine. We do not have any antivirals at this time, thus making it even more important that we focus first on prevention and also that we uh, uh, buy some time to slow the spread to give us a chance to come up with a vaccine or prevent uh, or treat the disease like we do the flu. First, you have to be able to test and find out if that's what you've got. And the nice thing with flu is we've got antivirals we can treat it with, um, and we've got vaccination, which is very effective. So leaving that down to the the number one thing that we need to use to prevent it uh, is the major public health thrust right now. We, We have learned that isolation and containment and quarantine does work but it's not going to isolate it. We're past that point now. We now have it spreading throughout all throughout 49 states. West Virginia, why they've been spared, I have no idea. So talking about prevention techniques, uh, first is respiratory etiquette. If you have a cough, cover it up. Second of all, try not to touch your face, and that is very hard for humans not to do. We touch our face a thousand times a day. Uh, we've got to learn not to touch our face, or if we're going to touch our face, wash our hands before. Uh, soap and water is all you really need to use, and with the respiratory viruses, uh, the gel hand sanitizers work very well. Now, the gel hand sanitizers don't work well with stomach viruses uh, that we tend to see. So that's where you still need to go back to good old-fashioned soap and water. If you're ill, we need to encourage everyone to stay home. What makes it difficult during this time of season is we have all the other respiratory viruses that are co-circulating, which makes it a diagnostic challenge. This was in the middle of summer, and I knew flu was way down, and the other respiratory viruses were way down. makes it easier to make that clinical diagnosis. <laughs> However, with flu continuing to circulate, all the other respiratory viruses continuing to circulate has made this a challenge in trying to work with the diagnosis. So how do we uh, – the other concept that we use in public health is social distancing. We know this bug is droplet spread, not aerosol spread. There's a difference. With droplet spread, it means droplets that you have when you cough or sneeze. Now, droplets tend to go about six feet before they land to the ground. So thus, the six-foot isolation uh, recommendation that we have, that if you're just hanging around, we want at least three, if not six feet, to keep you from that droplet spread uh, that's associated with it. The other is fomite spread, which is only probably in about 10% of cases. But hard porous surfaces, such as this desk, your desk up there, can hold the virus for a number of days. Usually 48 to 72 hours it can live and and be transmitted. With non-porous surfaces, it's usually just a very few hours that it can live. So a tissue, your clothes, only lives a few hours. So we've got to look at what our major strategies, uh, aside from social distancing, and we need to be practicing these basic public health measures every day anyway. We become lackadaisical and a little lazy uh, and nonchalant 
in dealing with our flu viruses and our cough colds season. With this one, we've got to protect our elderly. We must keep it out of our nursing homes. We've got to protect those who are greater than the age of 60 with comorbid conditions. That is our main goal at this point in time. People ask about special protection do they need to, that they may need to employ. Walking around with a mask really makes no difference. We use a mask primarily when we're trying to collect samples in the healthcare world, and we'll actually use an N95 if we're using an aerosolizing procedure. What that means is with your EMS guys, if they do duonebs, if they do the um, BiPAP, CPAP, in, in working with the patient, then if they think they're dealing with COVID-19, we really need to be wearing the N95 special mask uh, to protect yourself. Uh, so, once again, uh, in our community, it is not circulating. That's the good news. Our goal is to slow the spread and decrease the amount of resources that may be needed to take care of any one particular group at one time. When you, when you look at an epidemic and how it goes through, we see a logarithmic curve that goes way up and way down usually very quickly. We're trying to attenuate that curve and slow it to have a lower peak but over a longer period of time. As we get into community spread, we'll look at more advanced measures of social distancing, such as closing restaurants, closing places of public meeting, closing uh, any place where we have meeting groups of, the president says 10, CDC says 50 people. And so we're not quite to that point yet, although we are starting to limit it in the studies from Italy, Germany, Washington State, New York, they all have a universal message. If you wait till community spread to initiate your measures, you're too late. The cat is out of the box and thus much harder to contain. New York, uh, Mayor Cuomo uh, said he would give a million dollars for a ventilator right now, an extra ventilator. But you can't buy one for a million dollars. That's how tight their ventilator service is in their hospitals. In other countries, they, they're having a lot of deaths. And so we really want to try to skew that curve, get it down lower over a longer period of time, and make those social distancing public health measures that are so effective at trying to blunt this curve. And I'll take any questions that you all may have of me right now. Anybody have a question? No, just thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. And thank you for working with your social distancing, with uh, limiting your contact with the public. Um, one of our first priorities is public health, health care workers are also very limited, and we've got to protect that subgroup of people too. I got one question. Does, yes, sir. Does, does the temperature have anything to do with the life of this thing? Yes and no. Since this is a new virus, we have no real understanding of how it will move through the population with the summer season. And I think what you're referring to is what happened with the pandemic flu of 1918. It started in 1917, kind of waxed off in that summer, and then in the fall of 1918 came back with a vengeance. We don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, right now we're in the process of seeing it spread basically unchecked throughout major regions of the United States. The story is still being written, and we will not know the conclusion to this story for probably another year to year and a half. This is not a two-week event. This will be a prolonged event. And the longer that we can keep it from coming first into our county, and then once it does come to our county, blunt the spread of it, the better our outcomes will be. 
What's the once somebody's diagnosed with this? How long does it take them to for it to cycle out, or what's the I guess the life expectancy of the? Okay, the so you're look, talking about isolation uh, measures. If we have a positive person with uh, COVID-19, uh, they are isolated for 14 days uh, from the onset of their symptoms or three days past their complete resolution of symptoms, whichever is longer, not shorter. So it's a minimum of 14 days, and it can go farther if they're still having symptoms. So it may be 17, 21 days if they're still ill with it. That's good. Well, thank you. you got Is there more people dying with it than living? No, no. Uh, 97% of people live. 80% of people have virtually no symptoms, don't need any kind of care whatsoever. So you may mean out of the 5% that go to the hospital. Right. Of the 5%, well, <clears throat> of those that go to the hospital, we know that at age 60 with comorbid conditions, 3 to 4% will die. At another 4% per decade. So if you're looking at an 80-year-old, you're looking at maybe 12, 15% of death. We do know that when it gets into a nursing home, it's devastating. 35 percent or more death rate in that population. Which state is more active with it now than any other state? We've got, uh, let's see, uh, New York State has wide community transmission along with Washington State and California. We're seeing real hot spots such as in Boston and a number of other cities, and that is changing every day. And I'm having to look at the numbers every 12 hours to even try to keep up with it. See, I've got COPD plus I've got asbestos in my lungs. So I'm... You're at an increased risk with comorbid conditions. And so it's important that we protect people like you from actually even coming in contact with it. And the longer we can delay you coming into contact with it gives us a little more time to come up with a vaccine or an antiviral that we may be able to treat you with, say, a year from now. Any other questions? May I ask a question? Yes. Um, yes. Younger kids, I mean, like, you know, 10, 7, 10, 12, are they susceptible? And yes. Are they... Uh, the, the nice thing about kids is kids do great with this. 96% of children with the virus, though, will show symptoms. 4% are asymptomatic carriers. So the good thing is we can look at most kids and say, if you're sick, maybe we need to think about testing you if it's inside your community. Now, no need to test kids right now because we're still dealing with the flu yes. and all the other viruses that are circulating among the kids. They're walking little little uh, Petri dishes is what I call them. So, uh, <laughs> yes, we are looking at kids. We've studied the kids in China. There was an extremely low death rate in China with the children. Um, and, of course, if, you, if you've learned much about pandemic flu of 1918, it actually attacked the 30 and the 40-year-olds enough so to drop the lifetime expectancy in the United States by a decade because we wiped out our 30 and 40 year olds. Luckily with this disease, we're not seeing that. But we have to remember, we're an old population and we've got a lot of people walking around that's had cancer chemotherapy, on biologics for arthritis, on um, immunosuppressants. We've got lots of diabetics. Uh, and all those are at increased risk. Yeah. And certainly if you're at age 60, uh, which mm -hmm. I've reached that magic age, you're at increased risk. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, for you're coming. quite welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. A lot of good, a lot of good information. <coughs> uh, oh, I forgot one thing. Uh, information. It's good that we share good information sources. So 
First is www.cdc.gov. They've got a great web page, frequently asked questions. They also have guidance, like for city councils, on gatherings uh, and uh, other activities that you need to look at uh, and planning for that. Uh, the other is go to tn.gov forward slash health. And with that, you'll open up the coronavirus page, and down in there it will have a chart of all the numbers and which counties are involved. So we're, we're going to be looking to see which counties are becoming more involved and how many cases do they have. Um, and the other place you can go, of course, is uh, www.sullivanhealth.org, and we're trying to keep that page updated with lots of good and general information. There's lots of stuff on the Internet that's not good information, so please try to go to a vetted source. If you have somebody who has a question... There, we have a hotline at the health department. It's 423-279-2777. And we're running it through most business hours up till 6 o'clock for anybody who may have a question uh, or concern or about need for testing. Can they, if, if you're not showing any symptoms but you're carrying it, will that test show that you've got it? If you're a carrier, which we're not seeing a whole lot of, Usually, people they may be they may be infectious maybe 24 hours before that's still being studied, but certainly when you're infectious, we know that you can pass it on. And the average is called an R naught, which is the number of people that you pass it off to before you get well is usually two and a half to three. Flu is only one and a half, mm -hmm. so this is telling us this is a very infectious virus. Thank you. Now I think I'm done. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay, we're down to the discussion and the action. Dave Wilson with Madden and Craig. Thank you all for having me this evening. I'd like to uh, talk to you uh, about uh, our project update, but, uh, but specifically a discussion about these temporary pumps. Mayor, if you'll just guide me. I don't have the... I want to make sure I don't get off topic. Um, as you all are aware, uh, uh, you all had brought to our attention the possible need to supplement the igloo pump station during wet weather conditions. And uh, Alderman Ward, uh, you had brought up that uh, can we use the old force line. And I did not think that we could. However, it was left in. That was a, a good error, I guess, since it got left in and we can use it. So we went back, and uh, the documentation that I had provided a couple of weeks ago was from Xylem, X-Y-L-E-M, and that's a company over at the airport off of uh, 75. Those folks had provided the bypass pumps that were used by Iron Mountain when the pump stations were replaced previously. So they had gone through the computations and what would be required uh, to completely bypass those flows if necessary, and they gave us a rental quote for the same equipment that had been here before. And that also included uh, bringing it out, delivering, picking up, and then what they call an environmental fee. Uh, that quote that they had given us. Do you have both of these? I do. Oh, okay. I, I believe I do, Mayor. We had uh, for the... Uh, for the rental of those pumps, uh, daily rental was $428.70. They also would assess an environmental fee of $6 and then a, a delivery and pickup fee of $180 each or $360. So basically that adds up to a daily cost of $794.70. I'm just going to say $800. $800 per day whenever that would be needed. And what we were told was that they could uh, be out here within two to four hours of when they were notified. And what I would suggest if we do go the route to, to have these folks on retainer is that it's monitored and now you would try to call them a day ahead of time if, if we were worried and they shouldn't have any problem getting out here and setting up. Uh, it will require 
the connection that was left was not adequate as is to actually connect to. There's going to have to be some work completed to make that more sturdy. And what was left was a PVC ending and coupling. We need to have an iron mechanical joint. And we've spoken to Alan, and, and we basically have uh, a detail that was provided with that work previously that I believe uh, uh, working together, Mattern and Craig working with Alan, I think we can install a box and do that work in-house if you all elect to go this way. And essentially what we end up with is a quick connection uh, that when the folks come out here with the pump, one, the suction hose would be dropped down into the wet well. The discharge hose would be quick connected to this discharge at the force main. Prime them and good to go. That's the way it's been explained to me. The You said $800 a day? Yes, ma'am, per day. 430 the, the delivery and the and then 180 pickup, be, delivery and pickup are 180 each. But if it's consecutive That's days, it would be correct. You would have a if you only use it one day, right? It would be 800 dollars. Now, if you used it uh, two days, it would be that plus you would lose 100 180 from that. But because of that, you do get economy for use. So on a weekly basis. It's twelve hundred eighty-six dollars in ten days, and I'm going to assume a week is seven days, so it goes from four twenty-eight seventy a day to one hundred about one hundred eighty-five dollars a day if you kept it for a week. So for a week, it would be one two eight six plus eleven point two five every day for an environmental fee. Plus three hundred and sixty for delivery and pickup. So for a week, it would be seventeen hundred and twenty-five dollars, the total. And similarly for a month, <clears throat> so eight hundred if we do it one day, or portions of days thereof, seventeen hundred twenty-five dollars for a week. And based upon their quote, how did you get eight hundred dollars? Okay, four hundred four twenty eight seventy, and then the six dollars plus six plus, plus one eighty. That's six hundred and some dollars. Yeah, plus the it's delivery and pickup, so it would be one eighty to deliver and one eighty to pick up. So three hundred and sixty total. So pretty much eight hundred dollars the first day, four hundred dollars a day after that. Right, mm -hmm. right down. Yep, there balance four twenty eight. <coughs> And then considered an eight-hour day too. Yeah. Eight-hour day after eight Not hours. Not a 24-hour day. Half. Eight-hour day instead of 24 hours. Yeah. They consider a day eight hours. Okay. What do they consider a month? Eight hours times. It's on the okay. it's working days. Yeah. They have the yeah, 30, on, on the terms and definitions. Oh, yeah, right it's there. on the sheet you. there. Thank but you for bringing that eight up. Eight-hour day. And then they actually three to seven. If you three to seven days is considered a week. On the three to use for three to seven days is a week. Would so if we kept it for three days, we could keep it for six, and there'd be a a small about an additional seventy dollars given the environmental fee. However, I think it would wash out. But though. Those are the relative costs, and then monthly about $4,450. Those are the rental quotes. And then uh, Alderman Ward, you had wanted us to investigate a purchase and and uh, apologize. We were a little slow. Joel was a little slow. He was out of town getting this back to us. But the second quotation that he did provide to us on the 16th, uh, he gave us a breakdown of what would be included included. Uh, items A through I, and that's pretty much uh, turnkey, what they would bring out, and uh, the purchase price on these these pumps that, that they have quoted, and I did not verify if these were new or used. Well, actually, they did. They're new. For new pumps, that quote is $43,105 plus a, a $180 delivery charge. So 
uh, basically uh, $43,000 uh, if you did elect to purchase. I would, uh, this past year, for the purposes of comparison, uh, we would have had the need, how would you say, five times that we actually overflowed uh, yeah, three times? I'd say it's more around the five area. Okay. So there, for our considerations, it may be that these would be used five times in any given year. And So we just had five times that we called pump trucks or five times that we overflowed? Right. How many times did we call pump trucks? It's been numerous times. Yeah. And it's been more so preventative action being taken right. than actually in the overflow situation. So uh, that's just like this past weekend, uh, we had to call out a pump truck and we ended up hauling one load. Uh, we didn't actually get to the point where we were having overflow, but where the state happens to lower our uh, uh, floats in the uh, So I guess it's kind of like how many times have we had to call out, had, had to pump it five times? How many instances it's have? Instances like that, I'd say we probably had uh, about three instances uh, where we've had to call more than five loads. But, uh, yeah, Is that in addition to the five overflows? Yeah. We, if you take the, the largest... Uh, or the daily charge, which would be the greatest charge if you were doing it per day, uh, dividing that by the cost that they had given us, we would uh, be roughly 54 trips. Calling a pumper truck 54 times in a year would, would equal out. So over a five-year period, I guess, if you called, it would pay for itself if you called out 10 the trucks 10 times a year or within about five years. That should be a, a Rough equivalent. Wait, say that again. <laughs> if I wanted to compare, try to compare apples and apples, uh -huh. and every time that the truck or that the pumps would be brought, if you were renting the pumps and they were to be brought out, kept a day, and taken back, that's $800. So if I take the total purchase of 43000 and divide by $800. Okay. then that's 54 times. So you're not going to call the trucks out 54 times in a year, but how many times? Let's say it's 10 times a year or 12 times a year. So if I, if I use 12 times a year, then theoretically in, in four and a half years, you could have purchased the pumps instead of just renting them if they're called out that many times. I guess another thing also I was kind of thinking is, you know, if we if we get everything fixed within five years, don't know that that can happen. But if we get everything fixed within five years, we could always sell the pump and recoup some of our money. Yes, and because I looked at some used, and I think the cheapest one I found was twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what kind of condition it was in. And the specs. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, now I was looking up. I looked up the same thing that you you gave me. Good. And I, you know, and I'd certainly recommend that if you could find something like that that was in good enough shape, certainly I'd take advantage of it. I think that the uh, the biggest problem, because obviously we could use a much smaller pump because we're just supplementing. However, you, uh, this pump and any that would be equal to it would give you the ability to actually uh, theoretically pump as much as your pumps do so in case they went down and, and totally went out. I yeah, don't think that would happen. Uh, I mean, it's very, it might be once every 10 years. Well, this would be something that we could take somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like if the garage went down, we could, I guess we'd have a coupling on it somehow. If we made sure that we had that, which certainly we're going to with the other item I think we're going to discuss. We'd want to have that same set up at every location. So that right. Yeah. Is this is, would this pump also if we wanted to try to do some manhole repair ourselves? Is this the type of pump that we could use to pump out it from from bypass? Yes, I don't know. I guess it just depends on the that. flow coming towards you. And yeah, I know that it's uh, 
it is, you know, the suction hose, it would, I guess, matter, it would be just how that's primed and it catches. So I know when they do bypass pump, the manhole's typically plugged and it's allowed to fill. So it, to me, that's the same. Right. It should be the same. Now, what I have seen, you know, when you do bypass pump, you have to be very careful. Any spill at a bypass is just like an overflow, and, you know, that's treated the same as what TDEC would they would. I just didn't know if we could use it for something yeah. like that. Though, I would think so, except it's on a, it's a trailer, and it's fairly large. Isn't it? it's, it's fairly large. The bypass pumps are usually about oh, the size of this table, half of that table maybe, aren't they, Alan, or a third of it, whereas this thing is probably two tables big. <laughs> so when it comes out on its trailer, it's on a mobile trailer. Two of those, of that table big? Who do you think it's that no, big? It's probably half the size of... Okay. The bypass? Yeah. Or this? If you was to go ride onto Lakeview Drive, Bristol currently have two bypass pumps out at their location right now. They're currently bypassed. Which would be similar. That'd be a good if y'all have opportunity to look at that. So, what I had recalled, Alan, it was about, there was a trailer that the pumps yeah, were it's sitting actually on. Yeah, actually a trailer. I'll say it's a, probably about uh, roughly around between six foot long, uh, about four foot like you might have a riding lawnmower on or something. Yeah, yeah. and the pumps are basically, it's inside of a boxed area, so I mean, it's covered from the elements and everything. Mm. And the only way we would be incurring the diesel cost, but I mean, like, whereas in this situation, these pumps only would possibly be being used in a rainy situation or during rain events, because uh, we are, we're able to keep up during everything. What does it cost us on a pump load truck now for a load? How much we pay for a load? Actually, they don't solve the problem. It just helps a little bit. <laughs> well, it'll, it'll help us until yeah. we can get everything fixed. Until we get everything fixed, fixed yes. But. but like like Dave said, we could rig up all the rest of them. So if the pump went down, we've got That's we've got this that we could we could use. That's that's something else we need to look at is being able to keep these stations running if we lose power. And the new stations we have the outside hookups. We just don't have the generator. Right, and for that cost, we felt like we could rent a generator, and, and it, the, it is quick connected to hook a generator up to them. Do we know what size generator we have to have? Do we do. We've got. I, I can't tell you off the top. Of my okay, head. but I, I mean, but Jim back. Yeah. And do we know a place where we could rent one quick? That yes, and that. Uh, these, Place that's on 390, I believe it is going 
good. I can call Jim at 3 o'clock in the morning at East 10 and wake him up. <laughs> but do we have anything in writing from Bristol? No, we would need to get that now. That would be the mayor is alluding to. We want to make sure Bristol is aware of what we're doing in the city of Bristol and that they are okay with it. And my preliminary discussions with them, they should be. And what I would do if you all would authorize me is send them a letter and explain exactly what we're going to do. And, again, uh, anticipated usage, which, you know, this past year there was one, well, February 6th. That's the only time that the city ever refused service to the town, and everyone refused it that day. So in my mind, that was a very unusual event. That's probably the only time in 20 years. So uh, i got to think that, you know, given that type of situation, they could possibly call and say, please don't use the generator and we would be ob or the pump and we would be obligated not to do that. It would, you know, of course, a moral issue. I don't think, I guess they could come out and verify if you were doing it or not, but I know certainly we would just not turn it on in that instance. And then we'll need to talk to the Fentresses, right, if we yeah. do it the way well, we're we, talking about. Well, uh, there was a, uh, in that instance, and Alan. Yeah, I, I really don't think that would even be a possibility So they would just park beside the roadway instead of taking that down. That was our field guy was here that day, and he was thinking if we used it or had it quite a bit to bring it down and put it in the enclosure. The only bad thing about that is if we had a big rain event and we had to use pump trucks too, you won't be able to get a pump truck. If you got the trailer sitting there, you won't be able to get the pump truck in there, would you? Oh, it, it handled everything? Yeah. Okay. Other than the, the force main being a restriction, which that was the initial restriction while we went with the greater one. But it, and during that type of event, I mean, seriously, we would be, I think, that overflow of that station, we would be worried about life and limb at that time, I right. believe be my guess. But you're not saying that that pump is bigger than the pump at the igloo, are you? It's capable of pumping a similar flow rate, but in the four inch force main, it's going to be restricted and wouldn't be able to deliver the 300 or 350 gallons per minute. It may do in, in excess of 200 or 250 gallons per minute, though. Can the, li can the line that it pumps to handle that much? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The line that it pumps to, I, I don't have the exact slope it's on, but it is a an eight inch line, and at minimum slope will carry about four hundred forty thousand gallons a day, and that uh, equates to uh, uh, it's in excess of three hundred gallons per minute. So I think it would be. Let me do that one more time. 1440 divided by, yeah, and that would, and that's if it's going all the time. And what we're talking about is peaks and flows and spikes. I don't think we should ever, you would never see that over a 24-hour period. You might see it for 10 or 15 minutes. Do you think it'll solve our overflow problem then? In the short term, it will. And I think if we follow through with the garage pump station, improvements that we're talking about i don't think we would have a need for the obviously it always gives us more uh, uh preparation and more stability if we could have the ability to add it which we would with that quick connection and having that but when we rewrapped the garage we should i feel like take about 85 gallons per minute away from the igloo, and I and I don't believe during this past year, other than February 6th, we would have had the issue at all. That's the only day I can think of. Alan, you. That is that, 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 that. We've had events that have been fairly similar to it, but not to that extent. And that was. Yeah, and it's. I know it's getting, and again. Uh, 
as part of your collection system, and Alan is the registered respondent to be in charge of it, you know, you all are providing this as a service, and while you want to meet requirements that you're never going to overflow, that you're not held to that high standard. Obviously, here in Bluff City, there's been events that have occurred, and everyone is hypersensitive, and you don't want it to happen. But in reality, it could happen four times every year, and there's no consequences to the town financially or uh, regulatory-wise. Well, obviously, we don't want that to happen, but it gets to a point if you're trying to engineer how much money it's a cost-benefit issue. I mean, I hate to stand here and say that, but it's just like highway or anything that's designed. We could design highways to where there's never an accident if we could possibly stop it. But the, the ramifications of that is just too expensive. That's a bad example, but that's the thought. So we're going to have we're going to have the English station to put Fourth Main and, and the garage pump all going in the same line. Yes, and it would be <coughs> again. It would be the same. I mean, you're not increasing the flow; it's the same flow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess the next question would be: How soon can we get the garage line down here? We have. Uh, we have submitted, there's two-stage process, or actually three stages, with using the USDA monies, which we have uh, now committed to doing, using the USDA funding for the wastewater improvements. We have submitted the environmental work that had to be submitted, and we've gotten, I now have two out of five responses from the clearing agencies, and by... Next week is our 30-day limit, so if we don't have it, I'm, I can send a letter saying you've had 30 days' notice, we're proceeding. So we have that. Once we have that, USDA says, okay, you can go now. Then we're what we have in front of you this evening, I think, is a task order that we've uh, describes the services to do that. And, Mayor, it is, this is on the agenda. The, okay. I just wanted to verify that before I start talking about the garage pump station in Force Main agenda, and we actually would uh, would be completing all of the uh, services for the design, and then uh, moving ahead with the RD approval, and then the construction. Uh, you know, I would say, and we discussed it the other day, certainly within uh, backing out those numbers. Uh, I would say three to five months, four to six months, somewhere in that range, from now until out there and completed. We, four to six months until to, to completion? Well, is that what I said? The actual, I was thinking about the design, the actual construction, we would give these, uh, we would give the contractor out. Do you recall, uh, I think it was 90-day construction period is what we had with the other pumps. Mm -hmm. And... I don't think it would be the garage pump station is not as large. I think the bypass that would be required would not be as large, but 90 days would probably be a good rule of thumb for that type of work. So usually the biggest thing that I've seen with lift stations are lead times on ordering the pumps. So that's the actual work to put in the force main and to put in the wet well itself, I think they can do in 30 days or, or less. But to actually get the pumps here and get it all hooked up and the electrical and everything, that's why you have the additional time. Oh, I was thinking we were talking about diverting the line down to Lakeview. The, or Lake, Lakeview, Riverview, Lakeview. Are you talking He's about right. the temporary pumps or the garage pumps? The garage pump. pump. Yes, well. Is that included in what you're talking about? Yes, okay, it is. Okay, sorry. And it's, uh, and just to, to be a little bit more specific, the, uh, if it just involved the redirection of the force main, like we've discussed, I, I think that could be 60 to 90 days. It's not that much, but we do have the need to replace the lift station itself and to put new pumps in. That's That adds the extra time. We, this money is going to come from what we're going to spend on the water treatment plant? Yes, sir. Yep. We had... Uh, just to touch on that, we also have the, the work on Railroad Street that Alan had identified, and 
we're taking a look at that uh, survey-wise now, both of those projects. But the monies that uh, that would have been spent at the water plant were proposing three separate things. That's the garage pump stop pumps and force main, the railroad street replacement of, a, of approximately 800 feet of sewer and four manholes, and at TDEC's request, the installation of mag meters to be able to monitor our flows from each lift station. So, and uh, with that, we were going to uh, make sure that Allen had some type of comprehensive monitoring capability to be able to view that on his phone. And so, those three projects, we had an estimate of about half a million dollars for those, which was. Uh, about the money that we had left over for the waste or for the water work. May I ask a question? For the uh, garage pump station you're talking about, do we have to get a permit from a railroad? Yes. We will need a yes, and the, that's the, the bad news. The good news is that I believe we can use the existing pipe that's there now. It was actually verified today. Uh, through TV work and uh, where, where we are, the location that we would look at going across the railroad was the old discharge from the from the wastewater plant that previously went to the lake, and it's a large enough line that we would put our force main through that. So our permit should not include any construction or anything like that. It's going to be a straight up usage type, but that doesn't. There will be a fee incurred. I don't know what that is. I know our application fee is uh, $2,500 just to have them look at it. And then uh, I would say that uh, uh, less than 5000 overall. But that, thank you for reminding me of that. Well, you know, the last time we had to do that work, on, uh, um, we had uh, Senator Lumberg, you know, he helped us to get the approval. Yes. And I think he would do it again. Wonderful. And it didn't take us that long to get the approval. And I said we could have those permits under one for both of them. We just started paying 2500 twice. <laughs> Dave? He's writing down. Yes, sir. I just saying it'd be nice if we could just use one permit, but you'd have to do two different instances, wouldn't you? I believe uh, we don't. We shouldn't have any need for a permit for the railroad street sewer. It would only be for the crossing of the railroad from the garage. That needs to be verified. Uh, you know, theoretically or technically, the railroad claims that they have 100 feet right. of right of way on each side, which would mean there's folks, there's several homes in the yeah. city that would be within. And if you have even utilities that are parallel and don't cross, you know, if you ask them, they'll say, yes, you need a permit. Right. So in my mind, it's you are completing a maintenance activity to replace an existing line, and, and I would prefer not to even bring that one to their attention. We are not should not be touching anything that would touch them or any of their local motives. Right. And, you know, we've done the work adjacent to the railroad in the past and have not submitted any permits for mm -hmm. that, including the railroad street. If you all recall, yeah. we were really worried about it at that time when it was falling out due to the water leak. Mm -hmm. But those, if I could, uh, uh, those items, of course, the temporary pump and rental versus purchase, which... Uh, and the, the approval, uh, whatever actions you all would, would ask to uh, be performed, we could do that uh, this week. And then the uh, the task orders that would allow me to, to move ahead with the, the uh, survey design and documents to bid that or to construct that work at the garage pump station and Railroad Street. I think we're going to have to have another estimate on this pump. Yeah, we could get a price per used one. Since, you know, I mean, well, that's why I was asking how long the other would take. I mean, 
-hmm. Do we justify buying one now that if, if that's our next thing? If we are going to move that line, I mean, do we spend that kind of money if we're going to have it complete and right. within you, six months, yeah, you know, to have the line moved anyway? Maybe not the pump's done, but the line. Right. So I'd say just rent would be the way to go for now. That would be my recommendation, yeah. given the, co the total cost and the stamping out on a limb. Yeah. Need to make sure it's going to work. Yeah. I'll be, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, my concern, uh, if I may, the uh, I work in the industry, you know, and our company buys just about anything for anybody. And, you know, there are a lot of good vendors out there that can provide some. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, this is great that we right. have this opportunity locally to be able to rent this thing at will. Yeah. But, you know, I'm definitely not in support of purchasing that. Right. Until we did it, you know, uh, there, uh, uh, there's just, I, I think that, you know, at least we should do the due diligence Save as much in the can. bidding process, even if we decide later to purchase it. I, I agree. A good one. Oh. Pumps, uh, they're in the industry everywhere. I see them. You know, we sell them. Right. So, you know, if we do, somebody else does too. Right? I would think that we could almost use this cut yep. uh, and, exactly right. and send a uh, place an advertisement in the paper or to, if you have known distributors or vendors that you would want to see and send this to them and say, hey, Town of Bluff City is looking for this product, and right. and uh, therefore it would be a competitive situation. But but I'm in agreement. I think during this time, particularly, will be by the time this goes, we should theoretically be out of the wet bulk of the wet weather period, heading into the the summer and early fall, where we shouldn't we should have less instances of the wet weather and lower groundwater table. But I believe it'll occur at a time when we should have the garage. Completed by then. If, if I may, and this may be an Alan question, uh, how many units do they have on standby at, at any given time? I mean, and you said you referred to that other municipalities use Xylem. Yes. You know, so would we ever get into a situation where they, they just didn't have a pump for us? No, like uh, when I went to the yard um, when we had the bypass uh, before. Uh, What about the MJ connection? Are y'all going to, you and yes, the crew going to go we ahead and move forward on the MJ, MJ connection? The MJ connection right. And then, you know, obviously up there, we'll, we'll get news. So. Yes, and we would we would pr propose to do the exact same thing. So Alan or whoever he may designate would you'd be able to use and see the same situation. Right. It shouldn't be right. new each time. Same with the generator. Alan will get the same types of connections for a generator on each one of them and then bring the set out and the, the similar hookup so we're not relearning every time. Mm -hmm. The last thing in there, I don't, uh, if it was on the agenda that I had, was to complete the smoke testing. Uh, we didn't have that on the agenda, okay. but we already have approved the money for that. Then, uh, if you all we had, would propose to do that next week, I think we're going to have uh, some good time. And if y'all, we could get the notices out so that folks know that it's coming like we've done in the past. I would ask that that occurs. And uh, Alan, uh, what we had talked about the using the personnel, uh, I'll coordinate with Alan on that. Okay. 
Okay. We need to make motions on this. Yeah. Let's see. Probably at least I need to allow a week because the I think, mail is so slow. Yeah. yeah. If we could send them out tomorrow or the next day, we could possibly start the smoke testing Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Would that be possible, you think? And on the mail. Because it has to go all the way to Knoxville. It has to go all the way to Knoxville first. Yeah. How about this? We go ahead and send the notices out and, and start the date next Wednesday, but plan on the following Monday, if that makes sense. That would be the 20th. 20, 23rd. The 30th. Um, yeah. The week of the 30th. The week of 30th. Yeah, right. And that is the day that uh, the skated gentleman is going to be in town, Alan. Oh, you have day. Okay, we're going to have a discussion and action on the task order, Garage PS and Force Main number 3490, 3490. 90Q, that would be. Oh, is that a Q? Yeah. Okay. And that's just 3490Q. And the amounts that we have there are the are reimbursable through the USDA services. The 227. The, uh, we don't. Actually, it's just for the engineering right. survey and engineering bidding services at this time. And then the railroad document, if we do need to go through that. And the, I don't have those totaled in front of me, but we had for the study survey and design, 15300 bidding and construction uh period services, which includes the uh, review of shop drawings and the administration of the construction contract, all of our, our uh, project meetings, our approvals of the funding, the substantial completion and final completion services, and that uh, is 7470. And then if we have to do the railroad permit, and, and we will in this instance, Mr. Fry brought up we have an estimate of $5,000, and that would include any fees for the application. would usually just pass through us to the railroad. Um, we have the, the resident project representative there, which, you know, USDA has set that up outside of um, the typical construction Engineering, that's another line item that they will also reimburse for it if you all choose to, to if we go ahead. And there was a question now at one time about, uh, about uh, with the water plant and whether or not you all would do the, the inspection. But I, with this work, I would say, like before, Ed would, would do that. And this, this work would occur concurrently also, so the, the actual inspection work that we have shown we'd have one inspector it wouldn't be two different fees it would only be one fee and just like we're doing now yeah and that's so i had twelve thousand on the railroad street but that goes on at the same time we would not have that charge that's an hourly reimbursable that rd uh administers and they view us it's billed monthly and they audit that and keep track of when you're what you're doing are you saying on the inspection um, for um, both of them it's going to be the twenty four thousand? I think it and will not be. an additional twelve thousand. Right. It's essentially what it works out to, Mayor. Is uh, if you have a a man there forty hours, eight eight maybe nine hours a day, forty to forty five hours a week, that breaks down to close to twelve thousand a month. And I think the, where we'll actually be on site, he won't be on site more than two months for the pump station because it'll be the lead time. We'll be waiting on equipment, and the, it's not consecutive days. So I think they'll overlap. 
and then when they're accounted for, you only have one inspector. So like when we do our bills to you, uh, to you and to USDA, we won't have two employees we're building, but just the one inspector, and he'll be looking over both jobs. Okay. If that makes sense. So we can take off 12000 Actually, I think I have, but I have 8000 for the, let me make sure. Yeah, and that, again, well, when you say take it off, we're not really adding it. That's just an estimate, you know, of what, of what mm -hmm. we're. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. it's all. Obviously, we would if we had to incur the cost, we'd ask that you pay it. But before it came to something like that, we'd talk to you about scaling back or making another arrangement or whatever okay. it need to be. Well, do we have a motion on um, the garage space? I make a motion to go forward with it. Do we have a second? Take a vote, please, Sharon. Alderman Balls? Yes. Vice Mayor Harrington? Yes. Alderman Ward? Yes. Alderman Bowling? Yes. Okay. Um, do we have a motion on the test order for Railroad Street Sewer Rehab number 3490R? We'll make a motion to go ahead with. We have a second? I'll second. Take a vote, please. Alderman Walls? Yes. Vice Mayor Harrington? Yes. Alderman Ward? Yes. Alderman Bowling? Yes. Okay, now on the, uh, the pump, are you going to uh, make a motion to rent rent that pump? I think that's what we're doing now, isn't it, Allie? When needed. That's what I was doing. We'll make it contingent upon that, if that makes sense. So does somebody want to make a motion, and is it is it okay, Mr. Fry, if it be contingent up sure. on Bristol? Sure. And, uh, we'll and make a motion it, that we... It has to be. Yeah. Yeah. Make okay. a motion that we look into renting the pump contingent on Bristol approving it. Okay. So I'll do second. We second. Who second? I'll second. Take a vote, please. Alderman Walls. Yes. Vice Mayor Harrington? Yes. Alderman Ward? Yes. Alderman Bowles? Yes. Okay. Do you, do you have anything else? No. I have anything. I didn't know if on the getting off the agenda or anything. You know, we did. I had one other thing to speak about if you all can do that. I don't know if you can. It's a special call meeting, okay. um, Mr. Fry. Let's wait. If we don't oh, make man. any motions or actions on it? Well, I don't think you can discuss it. I can't discuss okay. it. No. I'm sorry for bringing it up. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank I, you. I, I, you. Appreciate you, Dave. Thank you all for letting us okay. work with you. Just holler at me if you all have any other questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we're down to discussion and action on the first reading on the ordinance number 2020-003. Mr. Fry. Um, this is a amendment to our budget uh, to allow the city to pay cash in the amount of $36,378 for a 2024 F-150 uh, police responder. Do we have a motion? Well, they might I mean, tell them you, that. Did you say you had $13,000 you got from the other one to pay on that? We actually won't be thirty-six thousand. What was it? With the insurance that we ha we received, and then the sale of those police cars, we uh, have sixteen thousand two hundred seventy-four dollars that brought in on that. So we're really having to pay out twenty thousand one hundred three okay, because we had that much bringing in. We'll use right. that on part of the purchase okay. price. And that's that's it outfitted and everything. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Ready to go, 36378 Except for the radio. And we have it. Oh, we have the radio. It. When we pick it up, it's got the plug in. We set the radio in and plug it up. Ready to go. Okay. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. Take a vote, please. Alderman Bowles? Yes. Vice Mayor Harrington? Yes. Alderman Ward? Yes. Alderman Bowles? Yes. 
Do we have a motion to adjourn? Hang on, hang on. Hang on just a second. Oh. Uh, let the record reflect there are no citizens in attendance at the meeting. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Not one. Just a female. Yes. <laughs> this beautiful young lady. <laughs> Who's made the motion to adjourn? I I'll make a motion to adjourn. I thought you already made a motion. Mm -hmm. Richard uh, did. I'll I second. I made a motion. <laughs> Who's second? Right. Yeah. Okay. I'll Take the vote, boys. Yes. Last Mayor Harrington. Yes. Alvin Ward. Yes. Alvin. Yes. Thank you all.